Well, I'm delighted, uh, Ramesh, that you have uh, agreed to have this conversation, um, not just because you're a leading authority on the responsibility to protect, but also because, of course, you played a very direct role in the conceptual evolution of, of, the, uh, of, of the notion. And, and I want to sort of go through the history um, leading up to essentially where we are, where we are today. And I wonder the natural question before we turn to the work and your role on the uh, ICISS um, is really the origins of the R2P as you see them. And I suppose I'm interested in here is not just Srebrenica and Rwanda in the early 90s, but also, of course, uh, Kosovo. So if you could give us a bit of a sense of how you understand the the sort of immediate and perhaps also the long-term origins of the of, of the thinking around the R2P. Sure. Uh, I think it goes back to Kofi, uh, the late Kofi Annan. He was, you knew him better than, well, you knew him at least as well as I did, if not better. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a deep humanist. He was the ultimate insider, uh, the only person who, began at the lowest rung and then went all the way uh, to Secretary Generalship. He was the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping, as you know, at the time of Rwanda and Srebrenica, and deeply scarred by that, to the point where when the inquiries uh, presented the report, he was happy to authorize them to publish everything, warts and all. And at the same time, he was extremely sensitive to the strength of raw emotions in the developing countries, uh, particularly Africa, in his case, extra sensitivity. But he picked up the fact that it was wider than that and that they felt as strongly about the NATO intervention in Kosovo uh, on moral grounds. And I think that struck him quite forcibly. So his initial speech, in September 99, about the challenge of humanitarian intervention, which provoked such an outcry, uh, led him to thinking, well, what can we do to bring this, uh, all this together as well? And he convened some internal confidential meetings with David Malone at the IPA, as it was then the International Peace Academy, where they went back and forth about how to proceed. And I think the idea of an international commission may have come out of that. Now, David, of course, being a career diplomat in the Canadian Foreign Service, would have had entry into uh, the Canadian foreign policy establishment. And it's Lloyd Axworthy who picked up that and said, well, are you serious about it? Uh, and then use his connections to bring together a package. And they obviously decided. Now, I don't know who were the guiding forces who decided on the two co chairs, mm -hmm. Mohammed Sanun, the late Mohammed Sanun, and <clears> Gareth <throat> Evans. In the meantime, you may remember we did a major project at the UN University yes, yes. on the Kosovo intervention. Yes. And that created quite a splash in the UN community. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember my office in New York was extremely nervous at the idea of doing the project. And then even more nervous when in March 2000, uh, I said, we'll do a project in the secretariat talking about that results. Uh, and I said, look, I'll be there. I'll chair the whole meeting. It's my neck on the line and said, okay. Yeah. But that created quite a stir. And I remember running into Kofi a week or so later. And he said, I don't know what you did, but people are still talking about your seminar. Yeah. So I suspect, that factor, plus the fact that I knew uh, Gareth from before. Lloyd had met in the connection with human security and he was fascinated to discover that someone had actually been working on the academic side on that, which at that point, people in Canada hadn't really been doing. So between the three of them, between Lloyd, Gareth and Kofi, uh, my name would have come up somewhere along that line. And uh, they brought together the commission, completed it. I, I think they tried very hard. Uh, I know several uh, women who were approached. They tried very hard on the gender balance, didn't succeed with that, but decided to proceed anyway, rather than delay it. 
And the idea was not to prejudge the position. They made it a point, they never asked me what my views were on that subject. And assembled the commission and I think they were lucky in the two co-chairs. Obviously a lot of care goes into it every time, but they were very fortunate in this case in the way it worked out in many yeah. ways. And in retrospect, I think they were very fortunate in that they had three people who were unusual. That's Michael Ignatieff, Gareth, and myself. Unusual in the sense that all three came with a degree of intellectual gravitas, but with the capacity, all three of them, to write complex abstract ideas and arguments in a way that is, that is accessible mm -hmm. Yes. to the lay reader who's interested. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think it's unfair to say that we were the three who drove the intellectual yeah. agenda to the point where at some stage we decided that we would actually take responsibility for writing the report. Yeah. So again, it was an unusual, possibly a unique yeah. Blue Ribbon International Commission yeah. in that three of the commissioners wrote the report directly. Yes. And I don't mean we told others to write it. We actually took yeah. up the pen and wrote, drafted it. Yeah. Uh, and, and Gareth being Gareth, he then takes over and tweaks here and there. But, yes. but we wrote it. So that's the origins and, and that's how it ended up uh, the way it was uh, uh, in terms of origins. But not clearly inside the commission, what happened in Rwanda and what happened in Kosovo, more than Srebrenica. Yes. These two were the most crucial background cases that we kept coming back to. And in many ways, we kept framing it, no more Kosovo's and no more Rwandas. Yes. So how do we find a balance yes. that allows us to find a way through this? Yes. And in that, the East Timor experience came in as well as an example of a good operation, UN authorized with buy-in from the regional actors, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And the fact that again, Gareth and I in particular in that commission being from here yeah. were deeply familiar with that case, yeah. uh, I think was a helpful factor too. Yeah. So those, all those came together in that it was a working thing that we worked at a rapid pace. So that, yeah. that, I suspect, is a background to it. Yeah. At the first meeting of the commission, uh, <laughs> there was a sort of hint that the secretariat, which was staffed by the foreign ministry in Canada, DFIT, uh, they thought that they might run the show. Uh, yeah. And it became very clear that that wasn't going to happen, uh, yeah. not just with the co-chairs, but with the commissioners who were there. It yeah. was going to be our product. One of the things that they did that was very good, I think, not only did they not seek our views in advance, yeah. they didn't direct. Yeah. They didn't say, this is what we want to come out of it. Yeah. What they did say was, it's your product. If we like it, we will promote it. Mm. If we don't like it, we will still publish it, but it's your product mm. and we'll wish you luck with it. Yes. And that was the extent of how intrusive, uh, how much they were going to intrude into our discussions. So we kept them informed, uh, but they never ever suggested anything uh, yes. by way of what they would like to us. Yeah. And I think that worked very well, that it was yeah. genuinely independent in balance, in composition, in range of perspectives, and in, and in freedom to think through and to talk to whoever we wanted to. Yeah. I wonder whether you could, um, having just set the scene in terms of the origins, I mean, say a little bit about the sort of central idea of moving beyond uh, the, the notion of humanitarian intervention and using this term responsibility to protect, and perhaps also respond um, to some of the uh, comments, or not the criticisms, but the comments that in actual fact, that is just a change of 
of terminology, but fundamentally some of the challenges are similar. I think your argument that there is a major difference there and it is important. And I wonder whether you could comment a little bit upon that. I also wondered, in light of what you just said, I mean, thinking about when the report came out, and I wonder whether you had time to, you know, or you thought about this, of course, very soon after that, or indeed before on the eve of it, we had the events of 9-11, of mm -hmm. and then a dramatic change in sort of geopolitical context from then on. I wonder whether how, how you think that uh, influenced the sort of struggle up to the summit in 2005 when you got this consensus document, uh, whether mm -hmm. that, that made it that much more, more, more difficult. I mean, it has this concept survived through that period, but it was a very difficult and different geopolitical context from, from, from the 90s debate. I don't know what you thought about that. Well, we did. Let me start with that, in fact, and then come back to your first yeah. question, because yeah. in a sense, it makes it easier. We signed off on the final draft of the report at a final meeting in Wakefield in Ontario, out, outside Ottawa. Uh, so it was a sort of like a cottage retreat where we came together and really went through everything, yes. clause by clause, even <clears throat> punctuation mark by punctuation mark. Uh, and that had some shall we say, not just free and frank, but tense moments and discussions as well. Oh, yeah. uh, but we went through that. And I think there, the contrasting personalities of the two co-chairs were very important in getting that through. One, making sure that it was driven through, yes. the other making sure that the commission didn't fragment and fracture uh, yeah. and there was consensus. Uh, it's again, an interesting thing to remember that it's, it's a report that doesn't just use boilerplate uh, platitudes and yes. analogies, it actually has yeah. substantive things that yeah. says very forcefully and clearly, yeah. but it was a unanimous report yes. with all the range of different opinions around the table. Yeah. So I think the two co-chairs were very important for getting that outcome yeah. and the commissioners. I mean, we, were, yeah. we had our own points of view, we had a bottom line, but we were prepared to listen. They hadn't just come to try and convert the other mm -hmm. side. So we signed off on that. And that is late August. I don't remember the exact date, but it's yeah. yes. mid to late August. The date's actually in the commission report somewhere yes. of the different meetings. Then you have 9-11. We convened a special meeting in Brussels at the crisis group headquarters with Gareth uh, as the host. And all commissioners who could were asked to come and attend to discuss the report in light of 9-11. So that would have been some point a couple of weeks later. We, yes. we couldn't leave it too late because we didn't want to delay the publication. Yeah. And the, both the co-chairs were there, I went, and we did go through it even before getting to the meeting. We went through it very carefully. And we came to two conclusions, which were in a sense very heartening. We decided, all of us unanimously, that we did not need to change a single word in our report that we had signed off on. That what we were talking about was interstate relations, not terrorism by armed groups. That it was going to take our report off the priority on the international agenda, priority list, that's fine. But there was no reason for us to change our report. Yeah. However, it, we, we tweaked the co-chairs forward with some acknowledgement of what had happened. The substantive part we didn't change, but that's where it, it came in. And after that, in a sense, we let the thing lie. What was more damaging to that in the short term was not 9-11. Well, that had happened before. So no, not that hadn't. It, but more than that, it was the Iraq war. Yes, yes. Which comes after our report. Of that course. was more damaging. Mm. And so the 9 11 happens. We publish our report in December 2001. Then you get the Iraq war. Yeah. And Tony Blair, in particular, using the language of humanitarian intervention. Yeah. Yes. And then the Americans, more and more, coming to use that because all the other justifications uh, fell apart. Yes, yes. And that was damaging. And Gareth and I in particular, we wrote quite a few op-eds at that time. 
Uh, Garrett did his access uh, in the Financial Times. I, I forget where else he might have written. And I was writing for national papers like Japan Times and the Globe and Mail in Canada in particular, but also the main Australian papers uh, and some of the Indian ones. And what we said was consistently that Iraq would not have met the test that we had laid out yeah. for a responsibility to protect operation. Yeah. And the fact that we did that from the start, and I believe that cost Gareth his friendship with Tony Blair as well. Yeah. But the fact that we did that from the start, clearly and forcefully, not using a code language and diplomaties, was very helpful later on. Because yeah. when the passions died down and I carried the burden of talking between 2001 and 2005 to governments and leaders throughout this region in particular, but also more generally in the developing world. Uh, and remember, or you may not yeah. know, I was the one who represented the commission, for example, at the 10th anniversary mark for Rwanda in the yeah. Secretariat building. Yes. along with Kofi and the Rwandan and Canadian foreign ministers. So I had in that period a very high profile <clears> as a, one of the two or three spokesmen on behalf of the commission uh, for yeah. that. And we made the point, look, here is what we said. Yeah. Forget about whatever preconceptions you may have. With this, do you believe if we had had this already adopted, would it have been easier or harder or no difference for the UK and the US to go into Iraq. Mm. And that forced them to think it through. And that's where I think slowly yeah. we began to win the war yeah. in terms of converting people to thinking, well, actually, this is both license, but also leash. Yes. And maybe it might have restrained them a bit yes. more. Yes. Uh, and Kofi was saying that also in many ways as well. Yeah. So, from that, let me go back now. Yeah. There were two things at the start. At the very first meeting, maybe the idea came from Muhammad because he was a commissioner on the Brunton Commission report. But whoever it came from, there was pretty much unanimous support for the idea that we should aim for something similar where the Brundtland Commission had taken two apparently contradictory intention concepts and reconciled them with the phrase sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So we said, could we think of something that will serve the same purpose while like sustainable development still being effectively a bumper sticker concept? Mm -hmm. It's not a glib phrase, but something which encapsulates both the debate, which hints at the tension behind it, yeah. but also the reconciliation that we might need. Yes. So we are conscious of that. Second, there was no doubt that several of us in the commission had deep familiarity with the discomfort throughout the developing world with the baggage of humanitarian intervention. And the contrast between the mythology of humanitarian intervention as used by Westerners and our own historical narrative of colonial oppression. Now, ironically, I think that would be an easier sell today around the world yes. because of Black Lives Matter, etc. Yes. But at that time, it still had problems. Yes and the whole notion of white man's burden, et cetera, mm. which kept coming up uh, when we went to different places, mm. um, meetings in Beijing, in New Delhi, certainly, uh, in, in Maputo in Africa. It, it was a fact there, uh, mm. but also in Latin America, where they said, you know, we have been subjected probably to more interventions than any other continent mm. by our great and powerful neighbor to the North. Yes. So it was a powerful factor there. And, the fact that we were very familiar with the inconsistency and double standards and hypocrisy behind that. How the language of humanitarianism 
had been appropriated by the powerful to camouflage commercial uh, and geopolitical interests mm. and say it was for our own benefit. Uh, and then they had sent us a bill for it. So there's no question that a lot of us were very, very familiar with that. And so we wanted to, not only did we understand the passion behind opposition to that, we were able to communicate that to the rest. Uh, and going back to the Kosovo project we did from UN University, one of my abiding memories from that is that when we convened the meeting, which is still in 99, I think it was in September in Budapest, what was fascinating to me as someone who straddles both worlds is how for the first time, people from developing countries and from Western countries actually came face to face and realized that the other side has strong moral feelings about that. Mm. Uh, and that was interesting also. Mm. So, we, so we were very familiar with that, that we wanted to avoid that. I personally don't remember who came up with the phrase responsibility to protect. Mm. Gareth says he did. Uh, no one else has disputed that. I have no reason to believe that that is not right. And he, I think he says he, he thought of it in the shower. I know that we tossed around similar things uh, and duty to protect was one of them. Mm. And for someone who doesn't speak French, one of the fascinating discussions that was held in the commission with a lot of people who did speak French mm. was that, that the French version doesn't convey the same potentially negative connotations mm. that the English version does the, throughout the, yes. whatever the phrases. Uh, I, I, I can't comment on that, but I know that we discussed that yeah. and that there are certain legal implications of using that phrase yes. as opposed to responsibility, which is much more clearly a political thing. Yeah. And if you read it, if you go back to our report, it's very clear that we wanted to embed it in a legal context, yeah. but we never went for the argument that this is going to be a legal duty. Yes. allow the genocide convention yes. for example yes. Yes. so that was an important factor there mm. but wherever it came from and as, let, let's assume that it came from Gareth which uh, well, highly likely is, is the case once we started tossing it around at every subsequent meeting it grew on us mm. and funnily enough I, that when I was doing my collection of essays for the last book uh, last year or the year before I went back I first used the phrase in print in March uh, in connection with the destruction of the Bamiyan statue. Saying, yes. who has the responsibility to protect a cultural artifact yes. that is part of the common heritage of mankind? Yes. Can it just be a matter of sovereignty? Yes. So it's an interesting thing that uh, yes. I said I, I used it uh, yes. at the time. And the question then became, what is the difference? Now, I don't know if you want me to go into that right now or, uh, but before yeah. that, let, let me let, come back to that later. Mm. We then, and I mean, I wrote that chapter, which is not a secret uh, for the commission report. And we went back to look at the thing. One of the formative documents in my thinking and writing at the time was funnily enough, a foreign office memo from the UK from the mid eighties, 86, I think, which talked about this and really summarized the argument against humanitarian intervention in three key arguments. Firstly, they said the weight of legal opinion is against such a right yeah. in terms of how the world has gone. Secondly, state practice since 1945 yeah. argues very strongly against it because the developing countries were very firm in expressing the opposition to it. And third, the potential scope for abuse of any such yeah. right yes. was so huge yeah. that they didn't think it was going to be accepted. Now this is 86 in the UK foreign office. And then of course yeah. you have the Kosovo thing from them anyway. So that was there. And I think it's, there, there were too many 
Western analysts who are suspect with hindsight supported R2P because they thought mm. it was humanitarian intervention dressed up in more polite language. Yes, yes. But once they took that position, then not surprisingly, many people in developing countries thought, well, if that is the case, why should we support it? Mm. And the leash part was forgotten. Yeah. And looking back over it, yeah. the bigger problem has been not overuse, but underuse. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as though people have been rushing in and authorizing interventions right, left and center yeah. under the R2P umbrella. In fact, it's been the greater criticism, and I think that the more stinging criticism yeah. is that we have not been able to mobilize international support in those yeah. cases where perhaps we should have been. Yeah. So it hasn't, in that sense, achieved uh, its purpose fully. Yeah. I think that argument also, uh, and you may remember actually, I, I think I first developed this argument for you uh, at KCL when I, when I did that lecture for you to your yeah. class, yes. that I went through that and then published that as an article later on in my book, sorry, as a chapter. I think it is disrespectful to multiple constituencies, starting with the commission. It suggests a degree of uh, disingenuousness on our part, mm -hmm. that we knew what we were doing was actually humanitarian intervention, but we were just giving it a spin and dressing it in a different language, yeah. uh, mutton dressed as lamb, if you like, or whatever, or the other way around might be yeah. better. Uh, I think it's disrespectful to people from the developing countries who came around to accepting our argument mm. that it was qualitatively different, and, and I will come back to that. And I think it's disrespectful to the UN community. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, I certainly never got the sense that Kofi thought it was essentially the same, and it would just make it politically easier for him. Yeah. Yeah. I think he accepted that, yes, it is different. The language would have been easier for him to use to convey what he was trying to convey, that there are two sides to the argument. Mm -hmm. And what we need is a new normative understanding and shared understandings of what it is we are trying to do, yes. what are the limits, and what are the procedures yeah. through which we have to go. Yeah. So if you go back to his dilemma, it meets that, you know, mm -hmm. can we afford in today's world to say, that sovereignty is a tyrant's charter, charter or a shield behind which a tyrant can commit any atrocities yes. uh, and human rights abuses. The, the world simply will not accept that. Mm. But if you remember, he went to the other side as well. Yes, yes. And said, if we accept that any one country mm. or any one coalition can go yeah. in, yeah. what does that do for precedence mm. in the future? Does that mean that any other group can go whenever they like? And yeah. he was, I think, genuine in doing that. And this one recognized it and put it through the UN. So then what were the differences? And I think that is key. So let me just go back to that. The first, uh, and, uh, the differences are political, conceptual, normative, operational. Political differences are essentially what I've gone through already. The origins, the history of colonialism, uh, the disrespect it implies in terms of a deliberate spin, either, well, it's disrespectful in the sense that either we are stupid, we didn't realize ourselves that it's really the same thing, yeah. or you're being deliberately disingenuous. Yeah. Uh, I don't think either is true. Yeah. So if you put the political side aside and then think of the consequences on the politics side as well, if in fact we agree that it is the same, then that consensus will fall apart as well. Yeah. Whereas the important thing to remember is for all the controversies, yeah. it's been contested conceptually in the academic world, but as a principle, it has not been recontested yes. or re-litigated as lawyers would say yes. in yeah. the diplomatic world, yes. in the world of states. Yeah. There, the controversy has been political with regard to implementation, yes. both when we should go in and when we should not, and what limits and oversight should apply during an RTP operation. But the principle has not been reopened mm -hmm. for discussion. So that remains, mm -hmm. okay? So conceptual is important. I think there's two parts in the conceptual difference. Firstly, humanitarian intervention recalibrates the relationship between sovereign states. 
shunts the international community right out. International community has no voice, no say, no presence in this. If we, the interveners, decide that you are abusing your people, we have the right and we have the privilege to take all means necessary, including military force, either in singly or in a coalition of the willing, to intervene and set you right. We don't need permission from the UN, that's irrelevant. We don't need to justify ourselves to the World Court, we will take action. So following from that, not only is it states against states and nothing to do with the international community or the UN, but also it is a license and only a license. Mm -hmm. Humanitarian intervention imposes no obligations yeah. on the interveners. It's a license and that's it. By contrast, R2P recalibrates two sets of relationships. Firstly, domestically between the state and its citizens. And that's where the reconceptualization of responsibility comes in. Yeah. States are sovereign. That sovereignty implies responsibility for the protection and welfare of the citizens against external threats, but also against internal threats. And if states fail to discharge that responsibility, citizens are voided of the duty to obey the state and they can dissent and they can do various things. So under the Westphalian system, Tyrants in particular use the shield of sovereignty to yeah. suppress with as much brute force as they wanted to their own people. And therefore sovereignty had been corrupted into uh, protection from citizens, yeah. not protection of and for citizens by the state, but protection of the ruling authorities from their own people using any means necessary. We change that. I and mean, I think we change that in a way that would be very difficult to go back now, because yeah. that, that is yeah. accepted all around the world. No government isn't going to argue against that. But the second thing we did was, we changed the relationship between the state and the international community as encapsulated or as embodied in the United Nations. Not between state A and state B that we left untouched. But between state A, which is committing atrocities and the UN community. So state A and all the other states that make up the international community speaking in and through the United Nations. So neither of these is present with humanitarian intervention. Yeah. And it's quite a significant double conceptual shift. But the second part of that is we said Yes, license when justified, but a leash also. If it's an R2P, then it has certain safeguards built into it. And you can't claim it as an R2P authorization and then go and act as if it were major intervention. Okay, so that's the conceptual part. Yeah. Then the normative part. Under humanitarian intervention, you Put aside, you break the norm of sovereignty and this correlative norm of non-intervention. And instead you talk about the rights and privileges of the interveners. Under R2P, the norm is human protection, the needs of victims. Those in whose name you are intervening have to be the primary focus of all your efforts. It's not about your rights and privileges. Mm -hmm. It's about their needs and wants and the responsibility that places on their own state and should that default, the responsibility that places on the other states that make up the international community. So even under R2P, interveners yes. have responsibility, not rights. Rights are with the victims. 
Also, if it is human protection, it's embedded in solidarism, the concept of international solidarity. We owe responsibilities to fellow human beings, wherever they may be, of whatever faith, of whatever gender, et cetera, et cetera, because they are fellow human beings. But if that is the case, it doesn't start and end with military intervention. Right. It imposes responsibility to prevent and responsibility to rebuild. And my only substantive criticism of the reformulation into three pillars by yeah. Ed Luck and Ban Ki-moon, yes. which in most cases works better, so I'm not complaining yeah. overall, yeah. but it loses sight of that peace building element, rebuilding element. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was one of the factors that went wrong in Libya, uh, for yeah. example. So yeah. that's worth remembering. Yeah. So if it's built on international solidarity, you have to stay the course until you recreate it. Again, as in East Timor, I think is a good example uh, yeah. of that. So conflict prevention, intervention, and peace building. And finally, normatively, it raises a question, okay, responsibility to whom? Mm. Go back to Kosovo. Under humanitarian intervention, your primary responsibility remains to your own citizens and to your soldiers, to the point where you had three months of bombing, no ground troops. The yeah. burden of risk was transferred entirely. Firstly, to the Serb soldiers, but secondly, to civilians. Mm. They were prepared to accept large numbers of civilians being killed rather than risk a single soldier of their own being killed. Mm. You can't do that under RGP. Yes. The primary risk has to be borne by the soldiers. That's their professional duty. The primary protection is that of the at-risk populations. Mm. And the second responsibility under RGP is to the international community. Yes. Both of these were forgotten, overlooked and violated in Libya. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it's important to think of it like that. Yes, yes. I mean, because they did not accept oversight from the others. Uh, You've authorized uh, us, now stay out of the way, and we are not interested in you. Then, procedural. That's a simpler one. Under R2P, you have to go through the UN, and in this case, through the UN Security Council. And finally, operational in the sense that. Again, if your norm is human protection, then your rules of engagement have to reflect the fact that the burden of risk has to be with soldiers, not with civilians. So there are distinctive guidelines uh, and, and requirements that come in, uh, and that is important. And I think you're helped in that by the fact that we had Klaus Norman, who after all was the senior yeah. military officer at the time of Kosovo for, for NATO. So that's a long, long answer, but. It, it, I hope it clarifies the distinction. It, it's an excellent answer and, and very, very clear. I mean, you also, in that answer, have, I suppose, anticipated um, <laughs> or, or provided a glimpse of how you'll respond to the issue of, 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 of Libya. I mean, mm -hmm. I was struck by, you made the point, and I remember it very well, that you and others repeatedly said that Iraq did not meet the criteria Mm -hmm. uh, for R2P, but of course the initial reaction at, after the uh, of the Libya operation, 1973, mm -hmm. particularly the threat of Benghazi, uh, others, I know Gareth as well, and I think you also wrote a piece, I believe, in a paper saying that this did meet the criteria. But of yep. course, but of course, the problem uh, you already hinted at that afterwards. I wonder whether you can just, uh, I mean, say a little bit more about the way in which it it, it initially looking promising and then. Um, uh, in effect, uh, not abiding by the, the original conception of the R2P, but also what long-term uh, damage uh, that has done and whether, for example, some of the things that followed in its wake, uh, the Brazilian initiative, for example, uh, to try to act responsibly, <laughs> whether that was something which already you had coveted, as it were, in the original doctrine, whether that was... We a, had. Yeah, yeah, we had. That's, we, that's my sense as well. There was a... The, the, we the, called it, yeah, <laughs> I, I forget which, which, which version called it what, but 
One version called it legitimacy criteria, the other version called it precautionary principles. Yeah, precautionary uh, principles, I think, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I forget yeah. which is which. Yeah. But we, and, and we went back and, and said to the Brazilians yeah. and, and said to the others that yeah. we welcome the Brazilian initiatives because it actually picks up what we had recommended, that, that it's something that the General Assembly should take up, not the Security Council, yeah. uh, because the development, the normative development is responsibility of the General Assembly, by the way. Yes. Under the 2005 formulation, yes. the authorization is the Security Council, but consideration and development ideally should be the Secretary General's office and the General Assembly. Yeah. Uh, I think what happened was this. They took the resolution 1973. They got the resolution through on the argument and in the language of civilian protection. But having got that, whether they had intended to all along mm. or whether they changed mid-course, I don't know. That's something you'll have to speak to them. Yes. On the, ba on the open public evidence, it suggests that they changed their mind after yeah. getting 1978. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because to be fair to them, if you want to be charitable, they realized that they couldn't get civilian protection without regime change. Yeah. Or it could be that there were too many, there was too much baggage with Gaddafi. Yeah. Yeah. Too many countries had, yeah. uh, had problems with him uh, and yeah. they were going to go after him now that they had the chance. Yeah. I think that was a crucial mistake. It may have come to that in the end anyway. Yeah. But there were astonishingly dismissive and disrespectful of the African Union. Mm. When you have a group of African leaders who are mandated by the African Union to go to Libya, meet the different parties and try and mediate between them. Mm. And just think of the optics. Yes. African elder leaders are required to seek permission from Europeans to go inside an African country in an effort at mediation mandated by the African Union. Mm. And that permission is refused. It was an extraordinarily short-sighted and damaging thing. Yeah. And that's the point at which they lost the support of the Africans yeah. by and large. It was a terrible mistake. Yeah. It may be nothing would have come of that, yeah. that it should have been tested. Yes. And then something that people have said to me repeatedly, well, was there an alternative? Could we have done something else? And I keep going back to Iraq. Even as of today, if we go back over several decades, the one period that was the best in Iraq's modern history, mm was between Gulf War and Iraq War. We threw Saddam out of Kuwait. George Bush Sr. had the foresight to stop the troops rather than let them engage in a massacre. Saddam stayed in power, but he'd been defanged. We had the no-fly zone, which by the way was never authorized by the UN. Yeah. Uh, the Allies claimed that, and there's just no stomach in the international community to challenge them on it. Yeah. So you can argue that yes. implicitly the UN community accepted that, yeah. but it worked. Yes. And that 12 year period mm. was better than the 12 years before yeah. or the 12 years after. Yeah. We could have had the same in Libya. Yeah. We could have defanged Qaddafi and fettered him inside Libya, stopped him from any nefarious activities, imposed punishment in the form of raids and strikes if he violated something, so he came back inside the box. Would not have been the ideal outcome, but would have been better than the chaos and the mess yeah. and the dysfunction yes. and the deadliness that we have had since then. And I think it has had a huge uh, enduring impact. 
I think it's the Libya overuse of the authorization <clears throat> that killed off any chance of effective Security Council action in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, it gave sufficient political co cover now for China and Russia to veto as many resolutions as were brought forth yeah. for any effective action. And, and they were not going to be criticized after that uh, very widely outside the West, yeah. uh, if, if at all. Yes. So it, it cost us quite dearly in terms of uh, yeah. constraining our ability yeah. to take any meaningful, robust action, not necessarily military, but yeah. robust action in Syria. Yeah. I think it set back the agenda quite a long time. Yeah. And that's going to be very difficult to get back to now, not because of intrinsic problems with r be, but because the balance of forces in the UN system has changed. Yes. To the West's net disadvantage compared to yes. uh, even 2003. Yes. Uh, and, and the ability of China and Russia uh, to not just veto the Western agenda, yes. but in a sense set their own agenda, it's quite different today compared yes. to what it was then. So I don't think you're going to get back to that. In general, I think UN peace operations and peace building activities are going to have a markedly less liberal template now yeah. for these wider geopolitical reasons. Yeah. But Libya helped yeah. make it more palatable for the rest of the community yes. to readjust to this uh, yes. reduced salience yeah. uh, of the entire cluster of human rights and humanitarian norms. Yeah. So it, it's been unfortunate. Uh, the Syrians have paid the biggest price for that. But the thing to remember in all that is the basic problem, and, and I don't know if you read it, but this was my answer to Roland Paris, his big article in International Peacekeeping about, about the structural dilemmas of R2P. And I said, no, the structural dilemmas are there, but they apply to any international use of force. Yeah. Yeah. You look at Afghanistan, you look at Iraq, you look at Yemen, you look at Libya, you look at anywhere else, whether it's UN authorized or not, whether it's R2P or not, any international use of force is now deeply problematical. The unintended and perverse consequences yeah. are grave and very real. And the net effect of all this, some UN authorized, one R2P authorized, others not UN authorized. Yeah. But the net result is that entire area, Afghanistan, westwards and southwestwards all the way to northern africa yeah. is in ferment is in chaos it, it's, it's impoverished uh, it, it's violent states have broken down societies have broken down economies have stopped functioning that's the pathology that we have to deal with so let's realize recognize it is not just r2p what yeah. it does mean yeah. is that an r2p authorization in itself is not a guarantee of a good outcome no, no, no. Good intentions don't necessarily make for good outcomes. And to paraphrase, uh, was it Brendan Behan in Ireland, I think, yeah. who was talking about the police forces, but you know, yeah. there is no international intervention that is proof against worsening the humanitarian outcomes. Yeah. There is no crisis, humanitarian crisis, <clears throat> so great that it cannot be made worse by an outside intervention. Yes. Uh, and that's not just how to be, but any intervention. Yeah. Well, I think uh, you sort of brought us up to what I was going to sort of finish on really, um, on, on where we stand today and the sort of legacy of R2P. Uh, and I think what's struck me a little bit, I mean, I do think uh, I'm actually, I know the positive is too strong a word, but I have, for example, tried to follow these large scale UN peace operations in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and one remarkable thing about that is that, you know, they're still at an all time high in terms of numbers. And I think even though member states on the Security Council have said it's time to pack up and go home. And I do feel that there is a real sense in which there is still a kind of moral obligation and duty to stay remain where there is a prospect of mass atrocity crimes. I mean, we had a conversation like this uh, not long ago with the head of the uh, mission in South Sudan. 
SRSG, uh, uh, David Shearer. And he mm. was quite emphatic that, I mean, in when they opened the, the, the refugee camp, you remember they had the, prison, the, uh, the, the protection of civilian sites. They did actually save uh, tens of thousands, possibly more, from what he thought would be a certain genocide or mass atrocities. And the link here, I think, to R2P is the sort of deepening sense and the sense that has been internalized, I think, across the membership that, the, you know, how a governmental authorities behave in relation to, to, the, to the citizens is a, is a legitimate matter of international concern. And it's difficult to quantify that or there are going to be exceptions and so on and so forth, but I do think it's real. Um, and, and in that sense, there is a legacy there in spite of the sort of geopolitical flux we're in now and these other aspects that you 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 bring out mm. i'm not sure what you think i mean that is a major that is a, that's an achievement yeah well it, it is but in a sense it's, it's a good question to finish off on because it brings together several themes and strands now some of us are old enough to remember why the word interim was put into unifil the mm. un interim for <clears throat> eleven. yes we got a request which I think the dominant sentiment in UN circles was we should say no. But for all sorts of reasons that we understand, we couldn't say no. So as a compromise, we said, okay, interim to emphasize that it's for a temporary period. It was six months at a time. I don't know what the current situation is, but for a long time, the extensions were every six months. The other was this sends a message that, okay, we'll come in and help. But if you're not interested in the diplomatic solution, we pull out again. But once we got there, the UN force itself becomes a stakeholder. Yeah. And for several years, UNIFIL was carrying on the necessary tasks of local municipal government and offices, registering births and marriages, uh, land sales and things like that. Yeah. And every time the question of extension came up and there was any slightest chance that it might be pulled out. It's the people of the region who would yeah. get together and say, no, you can't do that. Yeah. Who's going to look after us then? Yeah. So there's that sentiment yes. of wards, well, they are wards and be are custodians. Marry that to an incident from East Timor many years later. You remember there came a point uh, where the UN personnel were told to evacuate. Things were getting out of hand, very volatile, very dangerous. And there was more or less a rebellion. And, and a lot of people said, we can't abandon these people at the first sign of trouble and leave. So a lot of people took leave from the UN and stayed on. And that helped to calm the situation. You go back to some incidents under classical traditional peacekeeping. General Prem Chand in Cyprus when the Turks invade. And he gets his troops, unarmed troops at the airport and says, you're not going to come here. And the Turkish generals in here, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. You don't have the capacity to fight. Uh, and he said, well, I don't. You know that, I know that. Yeah. But you're, we, are, we will fight. You're going to have to kill us. Mm -hmm. And you will be killing the symbolic representatives of the international community. Mm -hmm. When that blows up, you think your politicians are going to accept responsibility or they're going to make you a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that he took that position yes. underlies every subsequent evolution of that history. Yes. Because without that, it's conceivable that Turkey would have taken over the whole island. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you know, General Rikke, the, the founder of the IPA, the yeah, yeah, yeah. had something similar in, in the 60s, uh, at one point in the Middle East when he was with UNF. Yes. Uh, they were flying somewhere and some Israeli planes came and buzzed them and his captain says, uh, they're telling us to land, otherwise they'll shoot. Mm -hmm. And Inder actually said to the pilot, well, I, I don't take orders from the Israeli generals. I take orders from the Secretary General, you stay on your course, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Now, I mention these because there are other sides to that as well, uh, including in Africa. 
where the lack of quality leadership has cost us dearly. Mm -hmm. When traditionally we have selected SRSGs and force commanders, we haven't paid sufficient heed to the importance of getting someone who can handle a crisis should one blow up, as opposed to satisfying donor requirements, political sensitivities, this and that and that. Yeah. I think the entire Cambodia operation yeah. would have been different and could have been a complete disaster yeah. were it not for the personality of General John Sanderson. Yes. At that level, even as a military person, you need diplomatic skills, courage, and military skills. Yeah. Uh, I think the same was true. I think we were lucky with, in Unprofor with uh, General Nambiar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some SRSGs have been very good. Yeah. So that is very important there. Yeah. One thing that no UN operation now will be able to do and survive with the reputation of its SRSG and force commander intact, is abandoned people, yeah. as happened in Srebrenica. Yeah. Doesn't matter what the mandate says. Yeah. If you or you know, if you have a force there, yeah. you remember how Romeo Delay yes. pleaded yes. to be allowed to protect the people. Yes, just yes. five thousand well armed people. Yes, I've talked to him since, and you know, he paid yeah. a very heavy personal price for that. But he insists, yes, he could have stopped it. Yeah. All you need is a small number yeah. of professional troops armed with the determination. Yeah. Same thing happened in East Timor. Yeah. Peter Cosgrove. Yes. yes. And Mark Smith is his deputy, both of whom I've known from before that time. Yeah. They said, we are not going in to fight. But if challenged, we will fight. If the Indonesian military or the militias want to take on a professional fighting force with the mandate and the heavy equipment for combat. That's their decision, it's not ours, but we are not going to run away. Mm -hmm. And one or two early incidents, not major ones, skirmishes, that determination was conveyed and that was the end of that. Yeah. So that leadership element is important. Yes. The, internalization of the realization that in today's world, the UN cannot cut and run. Yes, yes. I think that is important. Yeah. And that creative ability to think outside the box mm -hmm. and try and diffuse the situation mm -hmm. with a mix of firmness, but also willingness to try and find a way around. Yeah. That is going to be very important. And I think that that is important. Yeah. So yes, the protection of civilians, uh, one way or the other, yeah. with or without a coercive mandate, yeah. is an important ingredient. Yeah. Just as uh, gender sensitivity now yeah. Yeah. is an ingredient that you cannot take out of yeah. any peace operation, yeah. uh, regardless of what the language of the mandate might say, you're going to have to be sensitive to that. Uh, and, and, and the idea that you and peacekeepers themselves can be extortionists or sexual predators, yeah. uh, that is so anathema yeah. uh, that I think the next battle, if you like, in this ongoing war will be uh, this notion of individual accountability. It, it can't simply be the responsibility of the troop contributing country yeah. under yeah. internal processes. This is something that's going to have to be taken up. Uh, incidentally, one of the, I think possibly the first major study from within the UN system on the unintended consequences of peacekeeping was again, the project we did, uh, yeah. Cedric de Koning and uh, Chiu Kiawe in yeah. Tokyo and I, yeah. uh, which had a huge impact uh, yeah. both in the system and it's yeah. been very widely yeah. covered as well. So I think there are major changes yeah. that represent normative advances as part of that cluster of human rights and humanitarian norms. R2P sits comfortably in that. The thing to remember about responsibility to protect is it was never supply driven. It wasn't a collection of countries with militaries to spare 
looking for crises where they could intervene. It was essentially demand driven. Yeah. There were atrocities. In today's world, they come into our living room screens instantaneously. And we can't just sit by and pretend it's not happening and do nothing yeah. about it. it. It tugs on our conscience. Yeah. So what R2P does is it, it's the organizing principle for the international community yeah. to respond ideally, decisively, and in a timely fashion and effectively. Not so ideally, we fail on those criteria. Yeah. But because it is demand driven, because we know that in the foreseeable future, the world will remain a world of sovereign states. Human nature being what it is, not all leaders will be responsible, gentle, responsive to their citizens' demands, accepting of a withholding of consent as time to go gracefully and exit the political stage. And therefore, there will be leaders who will use force to brutalize their own people. Yeah. In those circumstances, our choice remains, we go in unilaterally or multilaterally in an ad hoc manner or with certain rules agreed upon in advance. Yeah. And with a built-in leash function or just a license to do what we want to do. Yeah. And on all those, I think in reality, because it will be demand driven, because people will react, countries will react. The choice is not between intervention and no intervention, it's between some version of R2P yeah. tweaked as we go along yeah. or back to unilateral interventions. And there, I think the balance is quite decisively yeah. on the side of R2P type, yeah. which is why they haven't abandoned the principle. Yeah. They haven't gone any further in trying to improve it. But that's because countries still are shy of addressing this ahead of a crisis. Yeah. Whereas the other final advantage of R2B always was, it wasn't detailed, it wasn't prescriptive. All of us had, most of us had deep knowledge of the UN system. Yeah. And we knew that at the end of the day, it would be a result, a political resultant of various factors in the Security Council as to whether they go in, if so, with whom, under what conditions, etc. Yeah. And we didn't want to specify that, that in advance. Yeah. But it's a formula for reconciling institutionalized indifference a la the old sovereignty or unilateral or unilateral intervention. It's a formula for channeling a shocked international conscience into collective remedies within a normative framework around which there is some minimum consensus that allows us to act. That's uh, an absolutely terrific uh, note on which to, to end. Uh, Ramesh, thank you so very much for giving up with your time and sharing um, both the history and a very good sense of where we are today. Um, I'm really, really very grateful. And uh, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. And uh, hopefully when um, the world is less, uh, we're prevented from moving around um, because of the pandemic, we'll have a chance. I hope our path will cross again in some conference setting or some other, some other yeah. opportunity. Take care. Thank you so much, Ramesh. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Bye, Matt. Bye-bye.